Hello, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel, Springboard Thought. Today I'm going to do a recent read. So five or six reads that I've had recently uh, that I'm catching up on still. You'll notice that some of my content is still Booker related. I'm catching up to the long list stuff and then it will go back to recent reads and maybe tags that I need to catch up on. But I'd like to just have two videos in the feed each week and be done with it kind of deal. So there's some content that is backed up, I guess, because of the Booker stuff, um, but it's coming. The first book that I wanna talk about is How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Sherry Jones. Uh, this book I read combo physical and uh, audiobook, and the audiobook was actually really good as well. I can definitely recommend that. So this book was really intense. Uh, I had to pace it out. It is about two women, two with a kind of like asynchronous timeline that builds up to uh, the inciting incidents, I guess, for each of their storylines centering on domestic violence. Um, it really takes a look at uh, toxic masculinity, and the ingrained uh, systems where these women live in the Caribbean, favoring men and how those systems continue to replicate harm on them. Um, they have no real recourse and they pretty much suffer interminable violence, sometimes, maybe not often, but more often than you would expect, maybe. Uh, sexual, as well as just physical domestic battering, and there's a uh, sensible death of an infant, there's uh, sex workers being mistreated, casual, systemic, not so much racist, but ingrained culture that is targeting these women and it's juxtaposing it with the uh, tourism uh, industry that exists on the island to cater to uh, white people, rich people. And uh, it constantly shows, again, the sort of casual nature in which people continue to perpetuate those systems and why they are unwilling to confront them and the damage that they can do, uh, and also the double standards <laughs> that occur when women need to take charge of their lives and do something about it, and the haunting regret that some of them feel uh, when they don't. It is a generational thing, even though the main characters are not uh, related, but the events that occur to them and how they relate to them are enmeshed and you work your way through the narrative coming to that kind of conjoined part basically and then it uh, and then it's over so i thought it was really great you definitely have to be in the mic right um mindset the audiobook helps uh, to get the voice like uh, there's a vernacular in here that might be um hard for like a default listener such as myself a white person to grab a hold of and so the audiobook is like really helpful in that and I think that's about all I have to say about it. Next on audio I read Anne Frank The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank. Uh, I read this on audio because for some reason my library doesn't have the physical book that is just this. It's It had some weird amalgamation of like critique and other books about the book with, or something like that. It was very strange. So I had ended up having to wait for the audiobook. Um, and then I read this with Shelley Swearingen. It was a really great read, far better than what I was expecting from someone of her age. She's um, clearly very precocious. She's outgoing. She's aware of her faults and her like foibles and quirks and stuff. Um, and it charts before she goes into uh, hiding all the way up to when she's discovered, basically. But you don't, only the reader would have that context, obviously. Um, I thought it was very endearing. She writes very well. And uh, 
the dynamics of the people in the place are really interesting. In some ways, I'm surprised that they weren't caught sooner. They had a harrowing misses from people who just, I don't know, some of them seem kind of like so acclimated to their life in hiding. They became unconcerned uh, with being discovered almost. Like, they just kept making a lot of noises or they would make a few like mistakes. They would go out at times when they shouldn't. They just a lot of wild stuff. And she even is precocious enough to read the previous entries that she makes about them and reflects on them and tries to sort of like, I don't know, shore up some of her personality. Um, so there's like a real sense of loss um, felt when she stops writing and especially when you have the context of why. So yeah, I thought it was really excellent. There is a few things that seemed a little bit redundant. There's a lot of like lists that are happening <laughs> that, I, that I'm just not really into. Um, and sometimes it focuses on details that I just weren't that interesting um, and I think would interest other people, but not so much myself. It came very close at times to being a five-star read instead of a four-star read, um, but those sections sort of uh, dragged it down. But uh, the audiobook was really excellent. Who narrated it? It was Selma Blair, and she did a fantastic job, I think. Next, another buddy read I did was Manhattan Transfer by uh, John Dos Passos. Uh, this is a three-star read for me, which is kind of what I expected. Uh, I wanted to read this before the USA trilogy, which I also have, which I will go on to read, maybe not this year, but next. I read this with Brian from Bookish, who is absolutely wonderful at this. Uh, he knew a lot more about the author than I did, and he kind of could situate the author in the writing time period much better than I as well. Um, I thought it was a lot more contemporary than it was initially. I think it was published in like 1914 or something. You definitely would be able to tell because of some of the vernacular and some of the <laughs> character type situations that you might find in the book, but structurally and the prose work and everything feels very contemporary, far, far and away um, ahead of its time, I think. There is uh, scenes that are being set in the beginning that feel kind of like a play, I guess, but with really fantastic language and with more information than a play would be able to get. He's really great at description when he wants to be um, and he is very good at sort of shining a light on different elements of the city that you probably wouldn't be thinking of. Um, he uses the five senses very much and predominantly the book is about charting I would say the immigrant experience there. I don't think every character was an immigrant, but more or less it's about the American dream and people coming to uh, New York via the Manhattan transfer that um, I believe doesn't even exist anymore. It was a station and attempting to make their life in the big city and encountering systemic barriers, some of which seem to break down their personalities and their personhood in various ways and forces them to compromise in order to get what they want or else to sort of crumble and, and break down basically. Um, there is, I would say, a lot of characters, some of whom are pertinent, well all of them are pertinent in a way but some of them are returning and some others aren't. Uh, and sometimes it can be hard to keep the thread of who is who and sort of what their purpose is and whatnot. It does come together rather nicely, I think. Sometimes, specifically towards the end, with people who have the same uh, names or similar to them, or if they have like um, st street names or whatever, like a, like a nickname, that is close to other people's names and they started losing the thread because there was just so many of them. But overall, I think it does a great job. It is intricately plotted. 
Um, it does a very good job of conveying its themes where it kind of buckles under its own pressure is in order to convey the themes, a lot of the characters feel like caricatures. Um, even as it's trying to be progressive, there's like gay men walking and they're not sort of like treated in the manner in which you would expect maybe. There are women I, th I would think would be attempting to be more, much more progressive than you would expect in the 1914. Um, like I was kind of shocked when they wanted to get a horse and buggy and uh, hated automobiles and said that automobiles would run people over and they were like fearful of them and stuff like that. That's how kind of contemporary it feels sometimes. Um, but there is also definitely just sort of like quintessential storylines. And so I had wondered if maybe some of these storylines have been so pervasive, I guess, in mainstream culture after this was published and got so, I don't know, inundated or co-opted by mainstream or literary um, people that were paying attention to Dos Passos at the time that they just became sort of almost perfunctory. Like you can tell exactly where they're going. Um, they speak in a certain way. They treat people in a certain way. It's antiquated in a very specific way. So uh, it didn't exceed my expectations, but my ex expectations of the book were quite high. Um, and it definitely met those expectations, which is not a bad thing. My enjoyment was probably more than the expectations, which I rate it by. So three stars is meeting expectations, four stars is exceeding expectations. Uh, this definitely met it, but it's a, you know, classic for a reason. Next, I consumed For All the Tea in China, How England Stole the World's Favorite Drink, um, and Changed History by Sarah Rose. This is a book that I cannot find. I must have shelved it in a weird spot. I had the physical copy and that's how I read it. Um, I give this book four stars and it exceeded my expectations. It's nonfiction um, in a very conversational way. It is really good at finding a central character who was most predominant about doing these specific things and, and making the most strides in this. And uh, he was very, he was a terrible person, <laughs> but he's so dramatic that he makes a very good central character for this kind of story and this framing. Um, and it just, it literally does what it says on the tin. It charts exactly how this happened. Um, and it, I thought it was very interesting. I don't read a lot of nonfiction. And I saw other reviews that wished that there was like more um, citations. She specifically talks about how at the end that she used X amount of referential material and didn't fill in the gaps. And so there are little like actual gaps in the storyline. Uh, that didn't bother me at all, but I guess other people wanted all of his uh, lifetime or his, his, all of those years felt like it was skimming and skipping, I guess, for some people, whereas I don't care about that and prefer my fiction to go specifically in those ways. I don't, I don't particularly think of nonfiction as like a narrative that fills in every single gap every single time period and all of this kind of stuff and it has a very specific goal in which it's trying to accomplish which is the title of the story anyway so it feels like a strange nitpick to me but if you're one of those people then i would stay away from this book um it's it is also framing a very colonistic is that a word it's from the point of view of a colonizer as well, uh, like unabashedly giving absolutely all of the facts so you can make up your own mind. Um, and some people I saw saying that like, we shouldn't be framing this and telling this man's story basically because he's, he's a terrible person. He essentially infiltrates China, dresses up as a Cantonese man, I think with like a fake disguise hires help, treats them very poorly, doesn't make any strides in learning the language, in kind of learning the culture so that he can even relate to the people that he's hired very well. 
Um, he talks about how in his journals, which this is based off of, he is constantly like being cheated by the helpers that he hires and stuff like that. So it's definitely one-sided-ish, but the narration makes it clear that he was kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> uh, so it didn't really bother me, and it it does, again, tell exactly the story that you think it's going to tell. Um, and it's very interesting, the methods in which he pioneered in order to get tea to a different country in the way that it is shipped, and uh, what worked and what didn't work, and, and stuff like that. But yeah, it didn't feel like the narrative was condoning his life or glorifying it or anything like that. Um, and I didn't know anything about this subject whatsoever before, so I don't have a contrast. There isn't a better book out there that I've consumed, and this one was only middling for that fact. So it definitely exceeded my expectations, and uh, I thought it was great. Next, I read a fantastic book, The Story of the Lost Child, the Neapolitan novels number four. Um, five stars again. So every single book in this series has been five stars for me for one reason or another. Um, it's hard to talk about the fourth book in a series, but what I loved about this one is again this book feels kind of like the first two in that it is a really good counterpoint to the third book. And so again, kind of, if you, if you think about them as duologies, I think you would really get an augmented experience out of that. If you don't want to read all four in a row, you could pair them up and then get really good experiences that way. And then, you know, leave off the third and the fourth book for a little while. But as long as they're read together, I think you'd really, really like it. Um, I can't really talk about any of the plot details because it starts pretty much directly after the third book after a huge, huge event occurs uh, in her life. It is much more concerned with her writing career now, um, which parallels somewhat the sort of fun auto fiction way um, that these books go. It is definitely not supposed, it doesn't purport to be that she in the story had written this book. Um, she's definitely writing other books, maybe something similar, but because she's a writer, in that she can sort of interrogate what writing means, what she's attempting to do, what she thought she was doing, what she reflects on in the past, um, and again counterpoint the the friendship from the very first book to this one, which makes an incredible book ending experience. Uh, <laughs> the ending is phenomenal. I think it could be polarizing for some people. I thought it was great. Um, yeah, th there's. I have no issues with this. It is fantastic at examining the culture, uh, both in terms of like the larger Italian history that is occurring at this time, as well as the evolution of the neighborhood, uh, the fluctuations, I guess, in the overall um, history, I guess, of the neighborhood and women's rights and the kind of agency and effect that the literature has on this area and in turn how she affects the area while she for one reason or another returns to it. Um, in one of the books she leaves for a little while. Um, there is a lot of interrogation about gender roles both in terms of her role as a as like a, a caregiver and as a the expectations of motherhood on her and um, just the social currency that she's able to garner and also lose unexpectedly sometimes um, just from the way that she purports herself as somebody who's kind of an intellectual um, who's returned to like a place of birth and it also definitely interrogates some of the stuff from the first book in which there's a kind of like mafia type situation that occurs in the village where everybody very much looks up to a dawn um, for various reasons. And so the juxtaposition of that household name and her household name 
from the beginning to the end. Um, it's just an, it's just excellent. Everything about it is, is just phenomenal. And then the last book I read was Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabriel Zevin. This is a four star book for me that just barely squeaked out a four. <laughs> it was like a three and a half rounded up because I'm positive about it. So this is about best friends that um, meet at a hospital. Uh, he is the main character of which we learn basically all of the story. He is um, somebody with like a, a chronic illness. They meet at a hospital, they're playing games, they bond over it, and then it suddenly jumps forward in uh, 10 years, I think, 10 or 12 years, something like that, where they're university essentially. Uh, both of them have made games and um, they're both very interested in gaming for reasons that are deeply seated in that initial sort of um, friendship bonding moment of games at the hospital and how their friendship was formed and then you kind of learn what happened to them like why that sort of unraveled why they aren't ostensibly friends anymore um, and it just charts the rest of their life as they begin to want to create games together and start like a their own kind of gaming company in order to do that basically uh, and how that affects their lives and how it affects their personal relationship dynamics it reminded me a lot of halt and catch fire if you've seen that show it's a phenomenal show so maybe not exactly a great um touchstone because it's a phenomenal material and a show versus something that's doing something kind of similar a reimagining of a gaming company and games that never was in order to talk about the sort of zeitgeist of that moment and how it has affected culture by way of a really rich dynamic um, friendship. And so there is some things that are really frustrating about this book because it devolves into a sort of like love triangle-esque situation for maybe one third of the book and I hated that. <laughs> but on the other hand, why they make the games that they make, the decisions that they make about the game, what the game is about, um, and how they go about solving certain problems are really fantastic. Um, I thought it was pretty organic. I thought that that was sort of the heart and soul of the book, I guess, in some ways. And so this sort of palette, like, yeah, petty jealousies and love triangle trysts and uh, them not liking the respective people that they're dating while having this sexual tension and stuff and I just could not care less about basically um, but it does manage to set the foundations for some payoff later on in the book at the very end essentially and so that's what sort of tipped it up for me uh, it vacillated between like a five star book to a four star book to a three star book to almost a four star book <laughs> if, if you want the chart. Um, there are a couple of characters that are really great. There's some very melodramatic moments that feel sort of manufactured and not super authentic. But from those moments, authentic moments are uh, ironically made. <laughs> so yeah, um, overall I liked it a lot and I don't know if some of my feelings are tied up for me loving Halt and Catch Fire and it benefiting somewhat from having the exact same sort of plot beats that that show has in some ways. I don't know. But I thought it was pretty great. I would recommend it to some people who are really interested in exactly what it's doing and nothing else. <laughs> Otherwise, I think that if you are just taking a shot and you're not that interested in games and if you don't care about sort of relationship dynamics like people who should be able to communicate well not communicating well and then suddenly once things kind of come together there's like a revelatory moment about oh if we'd only spoken these things earlier and whatnot then you might not like that section of the book as well thankfully there's a latter portion 
that I thought was very endearing and sweet as mentioned. So yeah, that is the weekly reads and I hope that uh, some of these books sparked your interest. If you've read any of them, feel free to leave any thoughts or comments below and I will see you next video. Bye.